Well, welcome to part two of our two-part series with Curtis Bowers, who happened to be in the Twin Cities, so I took advantage of that. Let me sort of reset things. Many of you listening were not able to hear part one, which, by the way, you can access at my website. Curtis Bowers is the producer of the two-part DVD series, Agenda, Grinding America Down. You know, on this program, I talk frequently about the deep state, about shadow government. I talk about a coming global system because that's right out of the Bible. And that would be in part out of Revelation 13, Revelation 17, references in the book of Daniel as well. There's a coming global system, one world government, one world ruler, one world religion, one world everything, currency, and a global leader. The uniqueness of the Agenda products is that it shows how dark forces have been trying to take America down for a hundred years because freedom, capitalism, democracy, free leaders such as Ronald Reagan and obviously more recently Donald Trump are pushing back against this agenda, trying to not let it happen. And it's going to happen eventually, but we have some opportunity in the meantime to push back against the darkness and get the good news of the gospel out, just get the good news of everything that freedom has to offer out to the world while there is still time. We never know when time will be running out. There is a set time when he returns and another agenda takes place that's called the tribulation and the great tribulation, followed by the second coming of Jesus and then perfect government. Folks, we got to wait for the millennium, thousand years of Jesus Christ on earth. Last week, I had Curtis Bowers give just a little bit of how he got kind of involved in all this. Curtis, thank you for coming back. Appreciate it so much. You know, why don't you just give us another minute summary of through a great book, Scousens, The Naked Communists. But how did that affect you? Well, it just opened my eyes to the changes that have taken place in America over my entire lifetime and before were purposeful. I thank God has blessed me with nine children. And as I looked at my children's faces back then when I first read that book, I just realized something. You know what? If we keep going in the direction we're headed, we're going to get there and they are going to live in a nightmare. And as a father, I said, I've got to do something to at least try to wake people up so I wouldn't just be sitting there watching their world self-destruct. So that's kind of what motivated me. And God used that and kind of pierced my heart to make a movie when I had never done that before. I knew I was supposed to, and he's blessed it in so many ways. And it won an award. It did. It's a story that's incredible, but... Well, your kids prayed for it. My children chose when they heard I was going to make a film to pray that it would win the largest single cash prize film festival in America. Mm. I did not have the faith that would do that. Obviously, it's my very first film. But they fasted and prayed, all of us as a family, every Friday for 22 months, almost two years, Mm. that this would happen. And it was instigated by my children, not me. The night we went to that festival, they came to the last award of the best of festival with a $101,000 grand prize, and they called out Agenda, Grinding America Down. I saw that online. It was very, very moving. That book, The Naked Communist by Skousen, it laid out the agenda. And we talked about that last week, folks, and that's get control of the schools, get control of the teachers associations, the NEA, have the kids start celebrating, quite frankly, mass murderers, Chairman Mao, people like that, promote these aberrant movements from transgender to homosexuality is normal. That's a normal way of living. And then, of course, infiltrate the church, the social justice movement, discredit the Bible. The radical John Dewey had a big part in all of this. So that's what was laid out in that book by Cleon Skousen some almost 50, 60 years ago now, back in 1958. And that's what had such an impact on Curtis Bowers, who then went on to make a DVD series called Agenda, Grinding America Down. You can get it in my web store. You can call us. You can find it in my various newsletters. My website is olivetreeviews.org. We'll give contact for Curtis Bowers as we move further into this hour. This is part two of a two-part series. We covered a lot of things last week. Find the programming at my website under radio, olivetreeviews.org. You can also find it on our YouTube channel. Okay, Curtis, let's head back into the discussion. We may touch on a few things that we covered last week. I do want to head into some church issues. And I did say to you, and you acknowledge that as you travel about the country, one of the most frequent issues that folks come up and talk to you and me about is, where do I find a church that talks about all the things that matter, including some of what we're talking about today? Talk to me a little bit, Curtis, about how this agenda, and it began at least 100 years ago, started infiltrating the seminaries. How did they do it? When did they do it? Do you know which seminaries they started to infiltrate? 
some of the things I came across, and more is mentioned in the movies, Benjamin Gitlow, who had been one of the founders of the Communist Party USA, so he kind of knows what's going on. In the 50s, when Stalin started slaughtering the people, he kind of was disillusioned by it, so he left the Communist Party. Well, he happened to go and be interviewed by our Congress, the Un-American Activities Committee, mm -hmm. and they were grilling him and saying, Mr. Gitlow, what were you guys doing in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s? And he went into a bunch of different details, but he said one of the key things we were doing, since we had such a limited number of people, we had such a small remnant there, we realized the most effective thing we could do is go into the seminaries, mm -hmm. get our degrees, and then stay and be the professors to teach the pastors. Because we knew if we could get control of the church and use its organization to push our agenda, we would really have something there. Lenin himself said, the best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves. Now, we don't want to destroy the church. We want to take over the church and use it for our own good. And that's what we see happening today. Whether it's the creation care pushed forward by groups that don't believe in creation, but they know we're suckers for any religious terms, any Christian terms, and we are so illiterate of the Bible, they know if they say Jesus was for feeding the poor, and so that's why we should be behind big government programs, most Christians in America will go, okay, I guess we should then. <laughs> Not going, is that how Jesus did it, or did individuals do it, and did the church do it, where there's accountability, and you can actually make a difference in those people's lives instead of enslaving them in entitlements. Yes, there's a long history there as people dig in, you'll see the purposefulness, the seminaries, I don't have all the names off the top of my head, but it was almost all of the top ones back then. And they just pushed it to minimize the Bible's influence yeah. and just keep it as, oh, it's a good book with some good encouraging stories, but it's not word perfect and there's errors all through it, but it's still good. And so it lost its authority because it was no longer God's word without mm -hmm. error. It was a good book of stories, but we have other things to push. So the fact that today one of the sacraments in the church is almost literally social justice is no surprise to you or me. No. And if you look at the history of social justice, you'll see it wasn't started by Christians. It was started by Marxists mm -hmm. that said, how can we package Marxism and Marxism ideas under the banner of Christianity? And so they came up with social justice. Mm -hmm. And of course, it perverts what justice means and it perverts what grace means. And so it perverts the message of the Bible and the gospel message. And that's why it is so deadly in what it's doing as is environmentalism. Now that makes you and I sound like we don't care about the polar bears when we do. We care about the forests, etc. I have heard you say, Curtis Bowers, environmentalism is communism. So you need to explain that. Yes, thank you. We all care about clean air, clean water, and stewarding our resources. That's why this is such a powerful movement. They knew they'd pick something that everyone cares about, but they wanted to redirect it to accomplish their goals instead of our goals, which are the clean air, clean water. And one of the most powerful things I can tell you to illustrate this is Dr. Patrick Moore is a man I went to interview in Vancouver, British Columbia. He's the founder of Greenpeace. Mm. So he cares about the environment. He was out there in the boat stopping the Russian whaling ships because he goes, no, these whales are amazing creatures. They shouldn't be killing them off. Mm -hmm. We have plenty of oil today. We don't need to use their fat and things that were mm -hmm. logical. But then he himself, when I was interviewing him, I said, Dr. Moore, what happened? And he said in the 80s, they started to infiltrate the Marxists and especially after the Berlin Wall came down, they started to infiltrate the environmental movement and they wanted to use it to destroy capitalism worldwide. Mm. He goes, most of the policies they're putting forth as environmentally friendly, he goes, they're hurting the planet and he really cares. Mm. He has a PhD <laughs> in ecology and he cares about these things. That helped the blindfolds to come off for me. And then as I dug in, I looked at a few other interesting things. When Gorbachev stepped down from the Soviet Union in the early 90s and we thought communism is over, do you know what? he did? Most people don't. I do. Green Cross. <laughs> he started an environmental group, Green Cross International, which is one of the most powerful movements worldwide because he knew, you know what? The best way to implement a one world government through the United Nations is to use the environmental movement because it's a one world issue that demands a one world solution. And they knew they already controlled the United Nations. So if we can get the UN enough power to implement environmental policy worldwide, which gives you control of everything. If you're in control of energy, alone, you're in control of everything. Mm. If you're in control of water worldwide, you're in control of everything. So they were doing it in so many different areas, but they knew then that's the vehicle for world government. That's the vehicle for yeah. us to get ultimate control. And here's the thing. The movement itself has elevated the earth 
and creatures above human beings. That's right. So it's the perfect thing for them. If people need to be eliminated to save Mother Earth, it legitimizes that, especially in a moral relativistic society like we live today. Everyone has got to cooperate. If they don't, we need to eliminate them because otherwise we're all going to die. So they've made it so great. Well, Georgia Guidestone says we got to get down to 500 million. That's from many billion down to 500 million. Also, still on this environmental issue here, Earth Day came along somewhere in the 70s, early 70s, celebrated on Lenin's birthday. Not coincidental, I'm sure. There's a tie-in. That's why Curtis Bauer says environmentalism is communism. We're still on the church, and I said this in the previous program, saving the planet now in some churches. Please don't hear us say all churches, folks. Many of you are listening are in solid churches and would never go along with this. Some of you aren't in solid churches. Saving the planet is more important than the Great Commission. That's what it's gotten down to. It's that bad. Yes, we've kind of lost the importance of the gospel because of political correctness. Why? Because the gospel can be offensive. And in this politically correct society, you can't say anything offensive. And so we've bought into that again, that lie, when in reality, the most loving thing we can do always is telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And our society has said the opposite. No, the most loving thing you can do is to be tolerant. But here's the funny thing. Tolerance literally is the opposite of love. Love is sacrificial action Mm -hmm. and tolerance is lazy apathy. Like, I'll put up with you. I'll tolerate you. And we can't allow them to do that because we need to love our neighbor by speaking the truth to them very lovingly and opening their eyes to what's going on. And they're trying to silence us from doing that. Folks, you're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. If you just joined me, I'm Jan Mark Kell. And I'm doing a two-part series here with Curtis Bowers in studio. He's the producer of the powerful two-part DVD agenda, and you can get it in my bookstore, olivetreeviews.org. You can call us, Central Time, get on my newsletter list. One of the outfits kind of infiltrated Curtis would be National Council of Churches. I think that's kind of not to be surprised by National Council of Churches, but it did surprise me when, again, this environmental agenda invaded the evangelical church. And that's why I say, even to some of the evangelicals, saving the planet has shoved out the Great Commission. And that I did not think in my life lifetime, I would see that. I didn't. And I think some of that is because we've got a lot of well-meaning people in the churches that aren't regenerated. They're really not saved. They're religious, and they've never read the Bible, so they don't know what it says. That has made them very easy, manipulative tools to use them for whatever you want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Just to give you a quick story how Mm -hmm. powerful this is. I was down in Florida visiting one of my nephews at a Christian college there that's respected. He was talking to me. He said, Uncle Curtis, I've got five roommates that are all in the Masters of Divinity program here to become pastors. And he was excited about that. I said, oh, that's great. And they're nice young men. He goes, but you're not going to believe this. And this was a few years back. He goes, all of them have Bernie Sanders posters on their wall. And he goes, I knew these young people when they first came here. They were not socialists. This Christian college has turned them into socialists. The Christian college has turned them into socialists. That's right. I think this guy is one of the most scary fellows that's come along. I was going to play a clip of him because he's obviously an enemy of capitalism. What troubles me the most is the way, and you'll hear young people cheer whenever they get sight of Bernie. He seems to be their hero. We're looking at a time where we have an out-of-control capitalism where the greed of the people on top is really unbelievable. I mean, right now, right now in America, you got three people who own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the American people. You got the top one-tenth of 1% owning more wealth than the bottom 90%. You got one guy, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, his wealth is increasing every single day by $250 million a day, but he pays his workers, many of his workers, wages that are so low that many of them are on food stamps or Medicaid. You got a situation today where the big money interests can now contribute hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into elections to elect candidates to represent the wealthy and the powerful, which is undermining American democracy. And I think people are sick and tired of the greed and the power of a handful of people on top. They want a government which represents all of us, not just the 1%. 
Curtis Bowers. You can tell that's a popular message. We talked about this in program number one, particularly the influence. We talked heavily about how young people are being seduced to believe that socialism is the only route to go. It's the fair thing. We spread the wealth around, etc. Bernie Sanders has a way of making it appealing. And that's why I keep saying, and I'm going to say it again. You might get sick of hearing it, folks. We are one election away from being a Bernie Sanders socialist nation. Curtis just said he has a nephew, Christian College. They love Bernie Sanders. What disturbs me most about that clip there is not the young people cheering at that. They're very naive and idealistic in their things. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is there's the man that is old enough to know what he's saying is a lie. He's old enough to know about Nazi Germany and National Socialism. He's old enough to know about the Soviet Socialism and the Soviet Union and the slaughter it caused. And he's so ignorant, though, that he thinks Amazon or some of those businesses, they would still be there if the man had not been able to reap the benefits of his idea. That's the problem. (laughs) They think you share this stuff. Well, then no one's starting the next business, whatever, because they know they don't get to keep it. Then there's no wealth to share around. Everyone is equally in poverty, just like Venezuela. And it all collapses in these young kids that are being used and abused by people like him are going to wind up 10, 20 years from now in poverty, not finding enough to eat, nothing to do because the whole economic system has collapsed and he won't be around anymore for them to, to say, you lied to us. Quote here from Curtis, because we talked about this in program number one, and that is, world government is the agenda. And they realized long ago the only way to accomplish this is by taking America down, stopping any movement worldwide that seeks freedom and independence, and creating as many wars as possible to make mankind feel the only hope of peace is world government. We talked about that last week in program number one. We talked about how that comes right out of the Bible, because that whole global system is outlined, is predicted in the Bible for a final generation. Are we there yet? I don't know. Certainly there are signs that would indicate that, that could be on the horizon. Curtis, let me move to a couple of other topics here. You gave a statement to me that I think we need to elaborate on just a little bit. I'm going back to David Rockefeller. We did talk about the Rockefeller empire in the first program. Folks, that is not conspiracy type talk. It's just history and the fact that the globalist agenda has been promoted by a number of the banking families. That's just an historical fact. The Rockefeller empire is very, very impressive. Now, David Rockefeller passed away here recently. But you said to me, Curtis Bowers, that David Rockefeller told Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama who could be their vice presidents, and they followed his orders. Can you elaborate on that? That's very stunning to make a statement like that. It is. It's one of the things that shocked me the most and made me realize some of these people really do have incredible power. I remember in 1980, when Ronald Reagan was elected, we were so excited. But before that, when he won the nomination, we'd been going door to door for him. And the day that the media announced, oh, tonight Ronald Reagan is going to tell who his vice presidential candidate is. He came out to the mics. He was a little flush, red in the face. And he announced that George Herbert Walker Bush was going to be his running mate. And all of us that had worked so hard for him, we thought, that's impossible. He Mm -hmm. hates George Herbert Walker Bush. And you just happen to hear, and I think you can still see these clips on YouTube, the announcer, not making a big deal out of it or anything, says, Oh, earlier today, Ronald Reagan Mm. was meeting with David Rockefeller. Mm-hmm. And you realize he is the one that told him that's who your candidate's going to be. Because you could tell Reagan did not want him to be there. But whatever was said, was it powerful enough to make him realize, I better do this. I better go ahead and pick him. And then what was amazing is 2008, as some of the people will remember, that's not too long ago. When Obama first got the nomination, he came onto the Air Force One plane with all the national media that loved him. They're all there waiting to hear who his vice presidential candidate's pick is going to be. And he slips out the back of the airplane. They close the doors and the plane takes off with all the media on there. And they felt betrayed, but they didn't want to cut on him because the Savior had been elected. If you watch the newscast from that time, it says when he announces his VP the next day, it said, last night, Obama had a private meeting with Hillary Clinton and David Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. And the next morning he says, "Uh, Joe Biden is going to be my running mate. And I just realized if you can tell a conservative Republican or a liberal Democrat who their VP is going to be, and they say, yes, sir, you have some incredible power. Part of the globalist agenda then? It is. They like to set things up to be in control. They could not stand Ronald Reagan. They couldn't believe he'd gotten elected. They'd underestimated him like they did Trump, where Mm -hmm. they just didn't realize how he's communicating to the American people. So then that's why they're like, well, we at least got to get one of our guys in there, the New World Order guy, George Herbert Walker Bush. We got to get him in there to be with him. So once this guy 
guy's done, we can at least get the next eight years can be ours. And so that's what happened. But going on with David Rockefeller, just for a minute, one of the other groups he started yeah, was called the, the Trilateral Commission. Mm -hmm. And its list of members is the who's who of everything. I mean, the leaders of all the Fortune 500 companies, all the national media outlets, presidents, vice presidents, congressmen, senators, it's everybody. This group, if you don't know much about it, which most people don't, because it's kind of back in the shadows, before he died in his pride, I believe, David Rockefeller let us know some of the things he had been up to. And one of the quotes that came out from one of his meetings with the Trilateral Commission is this. I'm going to read this to you now, and you will be able to see the heart of a man and then how he's conveying his heart to all these groups that are then going to implement that strategy in the businesses, if it's business people there, or in the media, if the media people are there, or into the legislatures, if the legislative people are there. And here's what the plan is. He tells us, so we don't have to guess, I wonder what what they're talking about in those secret trilateral commission meetings. Here's what he said. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings mm -hmm. and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity during those years. But... The work is now much more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. Mm. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in past centuries. Mm. Now, let me explain that for a minute, people listening. What he's talking about, he says the supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and the world bankers with them. He's talking about that group. He goes, we are the international elite that are sovereign with the bankers and our determination of what's best for the world is far more important yes. than national auto-determination. What is that? That's voting. That's you people that are listening. You voting for your representative. He's going, that's old-fashioned. We will rule the world because we are the intellectual elite and we have all the money of the world through the world bankers yes. and we will implement our world government. But all these groups were in cahoots with that openly. For 40 years, they've been sitting there listening mm -hmm. and pushing forward. And that's why these little shadow groups have such influence. They have put themselves up because the God of people that don't believe in God is the intellect. And so it, it appeals to the superiority of intellect. So they come to these meetings regularly and they hear, okay, this is what we're doing next. And they all want to be part of it because it feels like a special little private group. And so that's why its influence is a thousand folds of what it would appear to be. Fascinating story. Curtis Bowers is kind of on a speaking tour, happens to be coming through the Twin Cities. So I was able to get him in studio here to do a couple of programs. Program number one, you can find on my website, olivetreeviews.org. Go to radio. You can find it on our YouTube channel. That's under Jan Markell. Find the program number one, a YouTube channel or oneplace.com if you were unable to catch program number one last week. Let me just say one word quickly here. We're carrying the two DVD series, Agenda, Grinding America Down. Two DVDs, we're offering them for $25 if you're in the U.S., $6 shipping, or call us Central Time, please. Again, you can find it on my website. You can find it in our various newsletters. If you write to us or if you call us, would you always tell us what it is you're listening to? Because that helps us better process things here in the office. If you're listening electronically or to one of our approximately 850 stations, and we're pleased to have taken on new stations here in the last Last few months. Here's where I want to go in my closing segment with Curtis Bowers. You can find more information about him and contact him at agendadocumentary.com, agendadocumentary.com. We're talking a little bit about the banking industry. That may sound conspiratorial. Again, folks, it's just historical. The Rothschild, the Rockefeller, and more, J.P. Morgan, many more, played huge roles in the founding of various parts of the world, and also they are the major players in the company one world government. Well, it's on the horizon. We just don't know the timing. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. What about the Federal Reserve, which President Woodrow Wilson instituted back in 1913? It's about as federal as Federal Express. Somebody said it's not federal. It's privately owned. It's evil. I'm just going to say it. Lenin knew that taxation and inflation would destroy free enterprise. Quite frankly, we didn't even have inflation before the Federal Reserve back in 
in 1913. We'll talk about some of those things. How is all of this leading to a one world government? Well, we're not sure, but at least the players are lining up on the chessboard and they're kind of getting set to play the game. How much time do we have? We don't know, but we need to be about our father's business. In the meantime, we need to be salt and light and delay the decay and most of all, share the gospel while there's time. Back in just a couple of minutes, don't go away. While socialism has been glamorized for many years, it brings only misery and depravity, particularly to freedom-loving people. But today's progressive left likes to suggest that even Jesus Christ was a socialist. Send us your feedback through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. You can call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. Or write to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. More with Jan Markell and Curtis Bowers in a moment. It is now on the horizon. Understanding the Times 2019, Saturday, September 21st. Tickets will go on sale June 1st. They are general admission only and are $25, but include a lunch. After June 1st, we're asking that you call the Brush Fire Agency at 888-338-5338 or sign up online at brushfire.com. That number again is 888-338-5338 after June 1st. We are featuring six speakers and we begin at 8.45 a.m. Church doors open at 7 a.m. And the location is again Grace Church in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, just outside of Minneapolis. Consult our website for hotel information. Our speakers include Dr. Robert Jeffress. These signs that have been around for a long time, they are increasing in frequency and intensity. I think something big's about to happen. Yeah, I believe I we're too. in the last days. I believe the Lord is going to return. Amir Sarfati. And at the last trumpet, we're going to be out of here. There will be certain events around the world, and there will be the last trumpet, and we don't know the day, and we don't know the hour, but we understand the times and the seasons. Pastor J.D. Farag. Because there's coming a time, and I believe it's very soon, when that trumpet's going to sound, and everything here matters no more. I mean, shouldn't that affect us, the way we live our lives? Pastor Jack Hibbs. And he's not only spoken to us in his word, he is speaking to us right now in world events. He's requiring you and I to take what we're seeing in the world and match it up against the Word of God. And Jan Markell. I believe that the world is longing for a man with a plan, for a Mr. Fix-It. It says down at the bottom of here, is there a leader who can stop the chaos? We will also have a greeting from Lori Cardoza Moore from Proclaiming Justice to the Nations. The event will be live streamed at no cost. Again, that's Saturday, September 21, just outside of Minneapolis. We invite all remnant believers to better understand the times and become watchmen on the wall. Make friends for life at this annual conference. Learn why things aren't falling apart. They are falling into place. He is seeing the belly of the beast. I think he's still in confusion about mm. that. I wish he would see these films. He'd start to understand it's not about him. He is interrupting a hundred year long that's right. agenda. And that's why they're so after him. He's the first one to do it. He is fighting, whether he knows it or not, this beast we've been talking about to dismantle it because he knows it doesn't make sense. It's not good for America. This is part two of a two part series on the Marxist agenda to take down America and install a new system of government. The Bible is not clear if the end time one world system will be a socialist form of government or Marxist, but we know it will be totalitarian. It will be ruled by a man with a plan, a Mr. Fix-It, the Antichrist. Here again are Jan Markell and Curtis Bowers to wrap up our two-part series. Socialism is on the rise. despite being responsible for the deaths of over a hundred million people. Such secrets you keep. The full collapse of the Soviet Union, the crumbling nations of North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, the totalitarian police state of China. Socialists are coming out of the shadows, They're claiming virtue, moral superiority 
It's already infiltrated our government. It's dismantled our values, brick by devastating brick. I talk to people all the time. They'll say, oh, we don't have anything to worry about. It can't happen here. The Constitution will save us. We found a document that was smuggled into the United States through the Iron Curtain in 1960. My researchers found it again. It's the blueprint of how to legally and within the framework of our own system take over a country and flip it. We see it for what it is, a roadmap to socialism, a warning from the dead. Welcome back. We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. It's the agenda to take America down. It's a quite an elaborate agenda, and I've had in studio with me Curtis Bowers, who is the producer of the two-part DVD agenda, Grinding America Down. Find it in my bookstore, olivetreeviews.org. Give my office a call, Central Time. Find it in my various newsletters. You can sign up for those online. Curtis, some thoughts here as we kind of wind down. We heard a sound bite there that was Glenn Beck. He's been warning about socialism, America going red for a long, long time. He was laughed at for years We hear today in the political genre a lot about Democrat socialists of America, maybe a little bit of a fringy side of the Democrat Party. Not so, right? No, I wish it was. It's a fringy side of the Communist Party USA. If you look at the people that formed it and were part of building to what it is today, and they work together all the time with the Communist Party USA on our college campuses and everything. No, it's just, again, packaging the same old thing in new clothing and new packaging because they know some people don't want to go to the Communist Party USA website that's still alive and well, but that's a little too much for them. So they say, oh, let's just call it democratic socialism. But the end game is the exact same thing. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders, those are two of the most prominent. And I don't know, and I had Michelle Bachman in your chair here recently, a couple of weeks ago, and she said, she's never seen a freshman in Congress take off like this young woman has, even though she's offering some of the zaniest things imaginable. Let's get rid of trains, planes, cows, etc. She's celebrated as some sort of a movie star. My goodness. But we shouldn't be shocked. Here's why. You mentioned it earlier Mm -hmm. in the last show, the current communist goals from 1958. But if you read the complete goal number 17 on what they wanted to do to the schools, here's what it is. Get control of the schools. Use them as transmission belts for socialism. Soften the curriculum. Get control of teachers' associations. But they wanted to use them as a transmission belt to start creating a socialist person that believed it was just to share everything. And it's unjust when you have wealthy people and poor people in the lie that Mm -hmm. the poor people are poor because the wealthy people are wealthy because they don't understand economics where the more wealth a wealthy person creates, it helps the poor person too. Wealth is not a limited resource. It's an unlimited resource. Yeah, they've been just slowly getting these philosophies into our young people for decades. Well, Bernie Sanders is Democrat Socialist of America. And they throw that word Democrat or Democratic Socialist in front of the word socialist and tries to sort of soften the blow. But as you've said, it's nothing but communism. It's something to be concerned about, folks. It's part of the agenda. It's how they're grinding America down to get rid of the representative of the free world and install their wonderful one world government. That is the ultimate goal. The Bible says that that's going to be the goal of Satan. He's been trying to do it since the beginning of time. He's gained a lot of ground, and particularly in the last, I would say, 10 years or so. Curtis Bowers, and he has been my guest for two weeks. Let's talk for a few minutes about the Federal Reserve came around in 1913. It is not a government institution. It's as federal as the Federal Express, which is not at all. There's no oversight of this. It can't be audited, and it quietly steals our wealth. Came along 1913. 13, Woodrow Wilson. He may have even regretted he signed this into law. Nonetheless, he did. Income tax started 1914. Also, another thing that started right after that, inflation. Talk to us a little bit how this plays into the agenda. Yes, it's something that I think most Americans don't understand because it's been going on our entire life. And here's the thing. Those of you listening, do you think inflation is just normal? It's just something that always happens. Prices just go up a little bit each year. I 
always did. But then I started to study this and I realized, do you know from 1770 to 1913, that's 143 years before the Federal Reserve, do you know how much inflation there was in America? Minus 6%. Really? So prices literally went down 6% a little bit over 143 years because we had a currency that was gold back. So it can't mm-hmm. go up because gold always that's keeps true. its relative value. But from 1913 to today, everything has gone up a hundred times, not a hundred percent, 10,000 percent, a hundred times. I was born in 1965. A new Corvette in 1965 was $3,000. Today, it's Mm $85,000. Did Corvettes get more expensive? No, they did not. Our money lost so much of its value, it took more of our money to buy the same thing. And it's a tax. It's a hidden tax on us. And they knew this. John Maynard Keynes talked Mm -hmm. about this. He said, we will steal all their wealth from them and not one in a million man will be smart enough to figure out what we're doing. And that's what's been happening. But here's the strategy behind it. One, they wanted to control the wealth and control the world and the money system, but they wanted to make it so hard for us to get along in life and to pay our bills that we would need big government. It would slowly create a situation where government would have to be growing to help take care of people because you're like, we just can't make it. Now my wife's working, I'm working, we're all working and and we still can't make it. That was purposeful. They knew what they were doing and that's what has happened to our country and to our system. If you could grow your wealth over a lifetime with zero inflation, we would all be Mm -hmm. wealthy in this free system. Interesting. I think they also wanted to sort of penalize productivity, even reward lack of productivity, which is the mantra of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, guarantee everyone an income. So she fits into this whole agenda here so beautifully. Yes. And it stopped people from saving Yeah, because your money's losing so much value, you just spend it, which is also makes you then more dependent yeah. on their social security system or whatever. Anything they can do to stop you from being independent of them and not dependent in some areas of your life, they want to stop. It got really sinister in the 30s with FDR, what he did in cahoots with the Federal Reserve to take the gold of our country and never return it. Yeah. You say this, I'm quoting you here, I think that you might have emailed this to me. Let me give you one last example to show how the dire situation we are in. In 1933, FDR took the gold from Americans. It was never returned. Like promised, it was literally against the law to own gold until 1973. Over the next few years, all the world's gold came to the Federal Reserve for safekeeping because of the turmoil in the world. Then you say, Chiang Kai-shek deposited 125,000 metric tons of gold to the Federal Reserve. And then a few years later, our state Department sided with communist Mao Zedong to overthrow Chiang Kai-shek, and he never received his gold back. Mao went on to slaughter 65 million of his own people, and our State Department under Nixon still gave China most favored nation status. And it's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. they took the gold from him and then yeah. sided against him. Then in the early 70s, Nixon said to the world who had deposited their gold with the Federal Reserve, which again is not our government. Okay, this is no, it's a not pri- our government. Private mm-hmm. bank, and literally when they were started with an act of Congress, they made it secret. They said, you do not have a right to even know who owns the shares of this bank. So we don't know, even as a government, who controls, has 100% control of our money. But he, after the world had given all their gold, almost all the countries of the world gave their gold to the Federal Reserve and just took paper certificates. They did that because the world was unstable and World War II was coming and all that stuff. But in early 1970s, Nixon told the world, we just want you to know you can no longer redeem the certificates with gold and we will be happy to give you our paper dollars but the gold's not available. So then they kept the gold of the world. We don't know where it is, what they're doing with Mm. it, all the details of it. But that was just a strategy by the bankers to grab the wealth of the world, the gold of the world, and then give us paper dollars and let us trade with these little dollars that really, of course, have no value at all. Just the illusion of value because we still accept them for things. Talking for two weeks with Curtis Bowers, producer of the Agenda DVD series, which we carry, olivetreeviews.org and go to my store. You can also communicate with Curtis at his website, agendadocumentary.com, agendadocumentary.com. And let me just slip in this reminder here quickly, and hopefully you heard our conference promo a minute ago, that tickets for our annual Understanding the Times conference go on sale in June. You can order online at the Brush Fire Agency, brushfire.com, brushfire.com after June 1st. You can call them Monday through Friday, starting Monday, June 3rd. Here's the number, 
1-888-338-5338. There are plenty of seats for a September 21st event outside of Minneapolis, but remember these are general admission only, $25, and that includes a lunch. There are no assigned seats. All sales are final. And folks, don't call Olive Tree. The tickets are handled strictly through the Brush Fire Agency. Curtis, our time is winding down. I want to hit a few more topics. I also want us to go out on an encouraging note, too. And you've got some stories, a couple of them that are just tremendous, and that will encourage my audience, I know. Talk to me just a minute, though, about you said this. This was in an email to me. KGB agents that defected to our country warned us of all that the Soviets were doing inside and outside our country to bring us down, and everything they said was completely ignored. And then you talk about a couple of KGB agents. Their names have to be Brezhmanov and Golovkin. You say it's gone so far that recently the last two directors of the CIA have admitted they have been communists. One doesn't surprise me. The other one does surprise me. I mean, the last six months, Brennan and yes. Comey both admitted, yeah, we used to be communists. Of course, we're not anymore, but we were. I know from studying communism mm-hmm. and from interviewing communists and anti-communists, there's no such thing as an it's ex-communist. If he has had some revelation, he is so anti-communist. He is so against sure. big government, and they're not that. So I know they haven't changed from anything. They've just realized it's not very cool to say I'm a communist mm-hmm. anymore, so I better be quiet about that. But that's amazing. The most powerful, intelligent community in the world oversees what we do. And the last two directors in modern times admitted that they had been communist. It's unbelievable. Who is Brezhmanov and Golitsyn? If you go to YouTube and type in Brezhmanov, you'll find some interviews there done by G. Edward Griffith. Oh, yes. Back in the 80s, mm-hmm. and you can watch him for free. He was a KGB agent mm-hmm. that defected to America. He tried to get Congress, he tried to get the Senate people to listen to him. They wouldn't, so G. Edward Griffith interviewed him. And it's so powerful to watch today, 35 years later. He tells, here's the strategy of what we've been doing and are doing. And you watch them now, and they're so prophetic, because it's exactly, oh, that's what the news does every day. And he goes through the four-step process. And anyway, very powerful. We were warned so many times Mm -hmm. that this was what was happening, and we never listened. And I'm telling you, people that are listening, anytime there's 100% consistent behavior, Behavior in not listening to warnings that are destroying yourself, you realize there's an agenda. Because if it was ignorance, you'd some of the time listen, some of the times not. But consistency has never been a virtue of ignorance. And that's what people need to understand. That's what has made me dig in on different areas because I see, why would you be against something that's clearly the yeah. best for America? The other guy that defected was a man named Anatoly Galitsyn. He comes to America and says all these things that are going to happen to Congress, CIA, FBI. And they all say, oh, he didn't know what he's talking about. He got so frustrated that no one would listen. He wrote a book in 1984 called New Lies for Old. And in that book, he said, here is what they're going to do over the next 10 years or so. They're going to act like they're going to fold. He tells us that. He said, I think one of the things they're talking about is even taking down the Berlin Wall. He wrote that in 84. And then in 89, when it happened, we're all shocked. Oh, they took down the Berlin Wall. He warned. He said, no, no, that's how they really want to make you believe communism is over. They might literally do that. He warned us. Nobody listened. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's so frustrating. And one other person that warned us, and I want to talk about him to honor him because he was killed for standing up for us, but it's a congressman named Larry McDonald. Larry McDonald, good guy. And this is what he said. He said, the drive of the Rockefellers and their allies is to create a one world government combining supra capitalism and communism (laughs) under the same tent all under their control. Do I mean a conspiracy? Yes, I do. I am convinced there is such a plot international in scope, generations old in planning, and incredibly evil in intent. He said that in 1976, and a few years later, in 1983, he was on the Korean airline plane that was shot down by the Soviets. Mm -hmm. And his wife, who someone I just met last week knew, said he was getting ready that week before Congress to expose a bunch Mm -hmm. of stuff, and he is shot down by the the Soviets and a commercial airliner. I don't think that was an accident. No, it she didn't an either. Accident. Learn more in the two part DVD set that we're selling Twin Pack Agenda Grinding America Down. We're offering it for $25 for two DVDs, add $6 shipping in the U.S. And you say this, Curtis, to me, it's almost been 100 years and nothing has ever removed 
from our government bureaucracy, the anti-American, pro-communist, pro-one-world government people. So they have continued to spread their influence and multiply their power by hiring only those that have the same vision of a totalitarian world government. That is why the objectives of our government, the actions of our State Department, and the decisions of our elected representatives have almost completely been against the will of the people, against the good of our country, and against the love of our fellow man throughout the world. Then you say the cabal of the deep state people are all unelected, so we can't throw them out. Joe Bachman said the exact same thing sitting in your chair a month ago. I want to talk for just a minute or two. You've got a couple of stories we need to end with because they're encouraging. Number one, there are listeners right now all around the country, world for that matter, and they're thinking, I can't change this no matter how I try. There's nothing I can do. Obviously, we can go to the ballot box and vote for a little more sane people, but then even those people we voted for turn out to be one-worlders because the one-worlders are both Democrats and Republicans and independents and all that. But your dad did something unusual. Talk to us about it. Don't you ever give up because God can do the impossible even when we can't. But he never does that unless his people are being faithful to be obedient to speak the truth. In 1961, my mom and dad lived in St. Louis, Missouri. My dad was full-time in college getting a PhD in electroengineering, full-time working for McDonnell Douglas, so he was very busy. And my mom was pregnant with my sister. And the doctor had told her, for nine months, you cannot get out of bed. She'd already lost four children. Mm -hmm. And they said, you're going to lose this one too. So she stayed in bed, but she used her time wisely. One of the books she read was a book called Masters of Deceit by J. Edgar Hoover, the founder and head of the FBI. And he wrote a book in 58. He said, Americans, if you don't wake up, these masters of deceit are going to take you over from within. And in that book, he has a whole chapter on the church, what they see is going on. They're going into the seminaries. They're going into this, a whole section on the school and on Hollywood. And he tried to warn us. And he knew more than anybody, his head of the Mm -hmm. FBI. He has agents in all their little groups and everything. And nobody hardly listened. But my mom did. She read that book and it shook her up. And she told my dad, Jim, you got to read this book. And he said, I'm too busy to read that. I'm in school. And he finally read it. He said, wow. And so here's what they did. And I want to tell you, this is things you can do to be strategic. He'd be gone all day at school and work. She would get all the St. Louis newspapers and read all the letters to the editor. And every time one was written by someone that was sharp, she'd realize we need to connect with them. So she'd call them up and say, would you set up a study group in your home? And my husband's going to come over. You invite all your family and friends, and he's going to give a two-hour lecture on communism. And so they would do this one night a week, even though they were so busy. Well, my dad tells me this story. He said, I came home one night, it was pouring down rain and I was exhausted. And right when I walked in the door, mom said, I got a meeting set up for you tonight. And he's like, I'm too tired. Call and cancel it. We'll do it some other time. And she, her sweet, persistent self said, you've got to go. You never know who might be there. So he went. And that's my lesson. He was faithful in the little things and we need to be too. He drove across town, went to the meeting, probably because of the rain, Only one person showed up. Really? But my dad was faithful. He gave the man a two-hour lecture on communism. When he was done, the man came up to my dad and said, if half of what you said is true, we are in serious trouble. And my dad said, well, that's why I'm doing this, because I'm so busy. They became good friends. He started to give them all his resources. And within a couple months, the man knew far more than my dad did on the topic. And he came to my dad and said, Jim, I'm going to quit my job and write a book on this. And my dad's like, don't get carried away. You know, (laughs) He said, no, I've got enough savings to last two years. So he quit his job, researched for two years, wrote a book, finished it January of 1964. But he couldn't get anybody to publish it because he'd never written a book before. So he self-published it. Now remember people, 64, there's no internet, there's no credit cards. Mm. If you want a copy of his book, you literally have to send him cash or check in the mail. It's not in a bookstore in America. And in eight months in 1964, out of his garage, he sold six million copies of that book. And when Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States in 19. He said, I would never have been elected president of the United States if John Stormer in 1964 had not written the book, None Dare Call It Treason, the book that started the entire conservative movement Mm. in America. And I want to tell you this, those listening, you might not be the person to write the book, but you might be the person Mm. to influence the Mm. person that writes the book. We have to be faithful whatever God has given us to do, no matter how little it appears to be. Great story. And I want you to tell the Romania story too. 
We've referenced Donald Trump here a number of times. Both of us are open about the fact that he wasn't really our first choice back in 2016. He's dangerous to all of these people on the left because he wants nothing to do with anything that we've talked about today. It's just not in his paradigm. He's a businessman who wants to make America better, which is fine. I don't know that we have time, speaking from a theological standpoint, to make America great again. Maybe we do. I don't know. He's such a danger to them. He's just minding his own business, really. Yes, and he's trying to simply do, amazingly, what he said he would do. We're shocked when a politician tries to do that because it's so rare. We need to be praying for him every day. That's my point. Blessing, protection, and direction. That God will direct his path. God can use a lost man just as he uses a saved man. And we need to pray that God saves him. But he is seeing the belly of the beast. I think he's still in confusion about Mm -hmm. that. I wish he would see these films. He'd start to understand it's not about him. He is interrupting a hundred-year-long agenda. And that's why they're so after him. He's the first one to do it. He is fighting, whether he knows it or not, this beast we've been talking about, to dismantle it because he knows it doesn't make sense. It's not good for America. Here's the difference. Donald Trump wants everyone in America to have the potential Mm -hmm. of being prosperous and blessed like he is. And Bernie Sanders wants everybody in America to be equally poor. It's a total worldview of one believes that you can work and like the Bible says, reap what you have sown. Mm. And the other says, no, we're all going to share our misery together. Remember what he's talked about here, folks, and that is, if you take away nothing else, pray for our leaders, starting with President Trump and all of his cabinet people, many of whom are evangelical Christians. Curtis Bowers, and you can reach him at agendadocumentary.com. You can find the two DVD set in my store, olivetreeviews.org. You can call us Central Time. We'll get it out to you as well. I want you to tell the story as we go out of the program here. It concerns a rather evil man, but it's a wonderful story because of how it ends, about Romania and the war on God. We want to end with hope, and there's always hope as long as God is on his throne. I came across a story as I've been studying communism that's one of the greatest of the 20th century, and most people have never heard it. In December of 1989, Ceausescu was the dictator of Romania, and he'd been the dictator for decades, slaughtering the people, abusing them. The school children called him Lord. He was one of those type of dictators. Mm. In December of 1989, he gave the order for a church to be bulldozed, and he'd done that thousands of times, so it was nothing new. But something was different this time. The 25 people that went to the church and the pastor heard about it and said, you know what? Enough is enough. He's not bulldozing our church. We're willing to go stand out in front of the church while we're singing hymns, and if they come, they must take us out before they take the church out. Of course, they had no weapons. They'd been disarmed decades ago, so they just sung hymns and stood there. The bulldozers came up. They didn't know there was going to be people there, so they left to go get direction. What do we do? When they came back a little while later, as is usually the case, the courage had become contagious. Mm. And now there was hundreds of Christians outside Mm. the church singing hymns. So the bulldozers came again, didn't know what to do. They left one last time. They didn't come back till the next day. Well, the next day, there was tens of thousands of Christians outside that little church. And they were chanting, there is God. There is God. And and what they were saying so powerfully is communism says, Mm. they are God. There's no God. We are God. They were saying, no, 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 no. There is God. There is God. And because there's a God, we're willing to stand up for what we believe in. And so Ceausescu heard about it. And he said, send in the tanks. So the tanks rolled in and they started machine gunning down the Christians. But guess what? They didn't leave. Why? Because there is a God and there are things worth dying for. And as one would be shot down, another one would stand in his place. But as you look at world history and Bible history, you see when God's people are willing to stand for him regardless of the cost, sometimes he steps in and does the impossible. And that's what happened. After a few hundred of them had been machine gunned down, all of a sudden the communist soldiers stopped shooting. No one gave the order. They just stopped shooting. And I know it was God piercing their conscience with the reality. What are we doing? We're killing our own Mm. people here. And you know what happened? They rolled those tanks around. They drove them back to the palace. They grabbed Ceausescu and his wife. They brought them out to the town square and executed both of them. And the next day, which was Christmas of 1989, (laughs) the headlines of the paper said, the Antichrist is dead and Jesus is born. And I told that story in Florida and an old man came up to me and said, guess what? I said, what? I was in prison in Romania, Christmas of 1989. I said, you were? What were you in prison for? He said, for being a Christian. They always threw you in there a few days a month or however often just to let you know who the boss was. And I said, well, how'd you know what had happened? He said, we were in our cells Christmas morning and the propaganda station that's always playing the communist propaganda stopped. And there was silence for a few minutes. And then he said, over the airwaves, a voice came on reading Luke chapter two out of the Bible, the Christmas story. 
Now you that are listening, listen to me. Those people had no influence, they had no power, they had no arms, but they had the courage that it's right to stand for what God has said to stand for. And then God sees that faith and that courage and he steps in and in 24 hours, a communist dictatorship that's been there for decades, he crushes under his fist. The papers are proclaiming the birth of Christ Mm -hmm. and the Bible is being read over the radio stations. There is always hope. Don't you ever give up, but you need to be doing the things God has asked you to do, sharing the gospel, influencing those around you, and raising your children to walk in the truth. Curtis Bowers, thank you for coming in. You're so welcome. You know, folks, we've spent two weeks talking about an earthly system that doesn't work very well. And that is why I like to dwell on the time when Jesus Christ will be ruling and reigning on this earth. And I love this verse from Psalm 145. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts, the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures.